right, uh, let's get started. Uh, we got a lot of things to kind of cover. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, first and foremost, we just acknowledge that you are God and that we are not. And that you are good and you are faithful and your promises are true. And so today as we gather in this space to uh, study your word and to learn more about you and to learn more about ourselves, would your Holy Spirit just uh, reside with us? And would you speak to our hearts and would you challenge us um, so that we can uh, continue on the journey uh, towards perfection and towards you? We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so um, last week and the last two weeks, Marie has done just a fabulous job of uh, taking us through the, uh, a few of the chapters of Hebrew. And uh, one of the things that we talked about last, year, last week was uh, we talked about how uh, the one who is the word. And we also talked about how the one who is the word is the ultimate high priest. And then there was that comparison again. We've been doing a lot of this comparison between Jesus and others and seeing the, um, the ultimate of who Jesus is. And we talked about Moses um, and we talked about the fact that um, Jesus is the one who enters into the throne room with God, sits at the right hand, and he is the one who provides salvation for us. We also really briefly mentioned Melchizedek. And um, Marie said, we're going to talk about that later. I hate to inform you that today is not the day that we are going to <laughs> talk about Melchizedek. In fact, we will talk about him next week. So at length. So uh, it's a cliffhanger this week. If you want to know more about Melchizedek, you have to come back next week. Saying that, just as a front thing for you guys to know, uh, we have a lot of things to cover next week. And so um, I am going to ask, if possible, um, and you can, then we are going to go till 1130 next week, um, just so we can kind of stay on track with how we've got everything planned. But s chapter seven is so full with some things that we really need to spend some time on. We will be done by 1130 no matter what, even if we don't get through it all, I'll give it to Marie and she'll have to cover what I don't cover. She'll come in with a clinch. Uh, but uh, if you can stay till 1130 next week, that would be great. If you can't, then you can finish uh, via the video. So just wanna warn you up front for that. <clears throat> okay, we are gonna dig into today the second half of chapter five and the first half of chapter six. This section obviously connects us to what we talked about last week, but we're going to take a little bit of a shift in what we have been talking about. Um, for the past few weeks, we have been really, the pastor has been talking about this theological issue of who Jesus is and how important he is. And we've been um, inserting in here the fact that he is the high priest. Now we're going to get back to that next week, but there's a little bit of an interlude in this passage um, where it's kind of like the pastor takes a pause and says, before I can keep going, we need to kind of address the elephant in the room and then we can keep moving forward. If you have read the passage this last week, then you may have potentially gotten the impression that our pastor could be overly blunt, a little bit painful, uh, maybe gotten the impression that he is uh, shaming his listeners. Um, some commentators would say that he is using reverse psychology with his listeners uh, to get them to really hear the point that he's trying to make. I would say, on the other hand, that our pastor is one who has deep and profound love for his congregants. And because of that deep and profound love, he wants to be very clear about some things that they need to think deeply about. Um, 
So he is walking them through some challenges because he wants them to move forward. And he doesn't want to dance around the issue. He wants to put it out there and say, here's the choice that you need to make. Before we go any further, you need to take a minute and reflect on where you are and where you want to be. Um, <clears throat> everything, it seems, is kind of at stake in this little passage. If the congregation is to really understand what the pastor has said and what he will say next, they need to choose, choose to become very willing students and to change. N.T. Wright kind of says it this way. I love his words. This is why I'm not going to try to paraphrase him, but he says it like this. Our author, our pastor, must have known that his audience, he must have known them quite well, both to be able to make this analysis of where they were spiritually and intellectually and to have the courage to say it straight to them. He clearly wants to wake them up with his challenge. This is what we could call tough love. Accountability that is coming from someone who loves them deeply and wants more for them. He wants all that God has to offer for them, and he doesn't want them to miss it. So he says, this is who we are to be with one another. This is who you are called to be in your relationship with God. This is what you are supposed to be committed to. There is something at stake that is of much greater value. Don't get lost. Don't get caught up in the distractions of the world. Turn your attention to God. So with that being said, let me read you um, the second half of chapter five, and then we're going to kind of dig into his words. Um, and we're going to read the rest of chapter five, and then we're going to stop and talk about it and then read into chapter six. All right. So verse 11. About this, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the words of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Hard words, right? These are, he's not mincing anything here. Um, <laughs> he's kind of going straight in for, I need you to understand that all the things that I have said to you at this point, I'm not sure that you quite get them because there are some things, some pretty pivotal things that seem to be standing in the way. I want you to get them, but you have to determine if you want to really hear what I'm saying. So let's kind of break through in what our pastor is really saying to the audience. He starts off in this verse 11 by using this phrase, um, I want to talk about the high priesthood more, but you have become dull of hearing, which nobody wants to hear that they are dull of hearing, right? Like you're not listening. You've, you've tuned out. Um, you have taken a break. Um, you've put on the ignore button. <clears throat> what happens is their dullness of hearing has led to disobedience and a hardness of heart. And ultimately, they have lost out. They have become, at some point, they were receptive, but they have gotten to the point of failing to attend, to grasp, and to heed God's to heed God's message, um, it's, they haven't become passive. They've actively chosen to not hear at this point. And what has happened is that this group of people who the pastor loves immensely has seemed to move to a place of where they were leaders and they were growing, they have now regressed spiritually, moved back to a point of, what he says, you can't even eat solid food anymore. We got to go back to the milk. We got to go back to the beginning. We've got to go back to infancy at this point in your spiritual journey. And that's not where you should be. 
We shouldn't have to do that. But because of your choice to be dull of hearing, I'm afraid that you're not going to get where we're headed. So we've got to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> our, our group is supposed to be imparting the truth of God that they know um, and living out full obedience to Jesus in the place that God has planted them. This church group, this congregation should be growing. People should be hearing the good news around them. It should be changing lives. The gospel, not them, but their reflection of the gospel message should be changing lives. The community should be vibrant. It should be celebrating conversions, participating in baptisms, thinking of new ways to connect the growing number of people to each other and to deeper relationship with God. They should be studying the word of God that they know, and they should be holding each other accountable. They should be adding worship services, thinking outside the box of how to connect more people and how to tell more people in their community about the gospel good news of Jesus. But instead, they are struggling to learn the most basic and they're struggling to follow. And the thing is, it's no one else's fault but their own. They have allowed themselves to move so far from the truth and obedience. And I'm sure that in our own individual lives and probably in places in our community, we could say that's happened to us as well. Our author says this, you apparently just need the basic materials. I want to give you more, but until you fully choose and commit to Jesus, you are going to continue to be on milk instead of solid food. And the sad fact is, if you continue to just be on milk, the gospel message does not continue to get out. The pastor goes on to say, I want to um, move past the ABCs of spiritual faith, but I'm not sure if we can do that. Until you really live out the foundational ABCs of following Christ, we are going to continue to stay here in infancy. As N.T. Wright says it in his commentary, the thing is, is that in our churches today, we need to recognize the same tendency. It's one thing for people who are genuinely young in their faith or are genuinely, genuinely tired out and need a good rest to say, let's keep it simple just for a little while. It's quite another thing for people who have been Christians for some time and show every other sign of being capable of learning and growing in their faith to say simply, I'm just too lazy to do that. Let's not fool ourselves. Learning more about the Christian worldview, the large map on which we live, and more and more smaller bits of it is a way of growing in strength in our praying, our living, our work for the gospel, and in whatever we do. Holding back from such learning, perhaps with the false humility of, I'm just not good enough at understanding those things, when we really mean, I can't be bothered to try is a way of saying that we want to remain spiritual babies. We don't want to move on to maturity. Solid food, as our pastor says, is for the mature. The mature have attained the stability of character and consistency of, of obedience to God by their constant connection to Christ and moving towards perfection their desire to know him more, their desire to connect with him more, their desire to dig into the word, to pray and to be close to God, to try. Not that we always have to understand the complexity of Jesus and the complexity of what it looks like to follow God. It's the attempt, it's the constant desire that moves us closer. But if we don't have that, then it's what, his, what N.T. Wright says. It's like we are not bothered to understand at all. And that's not where we're supposed to be moving. And this congregation is not supposed to be moving backwards. We're supposed to move forward. 
So he says, it's about growing strong in your faith, regularly availing ourselves to the cleansing of sin and to the access of God. And this is really what he's saying in this first part, this second part of chapter five. I got so much that I want to convey to you, but right now we need to stop before I continue on. Are you ready to hear it? Are you ready to move forward in the midst of this? Do you want to pursue maturity and continued growth in Christ? Because right now, all you're showing me is childishness and uninterest. And if that is the character that you have right now, nothing I say is going to get to you. So before I go on, make a decision. So... How does his words make you feel? I'm glad I'm sitting in a Bible study right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Anybody else? Back in somewhere in my past, I wrote this. In here. How can you be in the fold and still turn your back? Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that um, that more specifically in just a few minutes because our pastor in the front end of chapter six really kind of addresses that particular statement right there. Um, so that's a good yes. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more. <clears throat> All those things that you listed, the praying, the, um, the uh, praying, our living, our work for the gospel. Yes. Mm-hmm. If all those things that you, li- you listed are part of the sanctification <clears throat> that we should be going through daily. Mm-hmm. And if we're not, if we're not spending time with the Lord, and we're, if we're not in His Word, and we're not praying, then. Um, <clears throat> We're, we're not doing our part yeah. toward that salvation that we have. Yeah. I think that somewhere along the line, there, I don't know I'm, I'm, that anyone consciously makes a decision, but I also know that sometimes I subconsciously make my own decision of this, that when we accept Christ, you know, uh, John Wesley talks about um, grace like a house. And um, <clears throat> ultimately, you choose to go into the house. That's, that's the moment of justifying grace. And then the rest of your life, you explore the house. But if I only stand in the doorway, then I've done a disservice to the beauty of the house and to myself and the potential exploration of the amazing things that can be in the house. But, and that's, that's infancy. And that's my choice. That has become my choice. That has nothing to do with God because his constant desire is that we walk through the door of the house and we walk all around and we learn and we grow and we experience things. And there's some cool light fixtures and there's some neat wainscoting on the wall. I mean, like the house is amazing and we're not always going to get and understand everything in the house. But the exploration of the house is the rest of our life. And God, all he can do is open the doors of the house and say, come in and explore it. When we choose to stay at the doorway, that's our choice. And what we miss out is we've denied ourselves. Nobody else has stopped us from continuing to go in the doorway. We have stopped ourselves. And I think too often we try to blame everybody else. We try to blame somebody else who stopped us at the door. It's us. Well, you know, too, there's a there's <coughs> that's going in that there is an out. There is, you're yes. You're going to stumble, uh-huh. <clears throat> but that's okay. Yeah. Because you're not God. That's right. And he's the only one that doesn't. Mm-hmm. And he, he made provisions for it. Yep. Which is why I'm saying I think sometimes I, I admit that I find myself in exploring the house. I've stepped back to the door. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you, you're like, this is hard. Like, I could go back out this door right now. There's everything else. When you get discouraged. That's right. You do. 
Yeah, and so this is, and this is what our, our, our pastor is saying. He recognizes about the congregation. They have been discouraged. It has been hard. He's, he's not trying to deny that for his congregation. He's just saying, now you have a choice. Are you gonna to continue to be discouraged? Or are you gonna trust in the God of all creation who has done all of these things that I've been explaining to you and trying to take you deeper into understanding for? Are you gonna trust him? Or are you just gonna to continue to be discouraged? Well, discouragement and walking out that door is just going to bring darkness. A darkness that we lived in at some point and we didn't want it anymore. That's why we chose to walk through the door and be with God. And yet we find ourselves walking back to the door, sometimes thinking, well, maybe that darkness is better than this. New Christians, <clears throat> I've heard it described like when, when you first know that you're saved and you've mm -hmm. accepted Christ, you're on the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. And everything is wonderful, and you're excited, and you're into it. <coughs> but life happens, mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to stay on the mountaintop mm -hmm. because the part of the learning and yeah. the sanctification comes by going through the dark periods yeah. and pulling yourself back out mm -hmm. and finding that mountaintop again. Yeah. And a lot of what our pastor is talking about in his sermon is, I recognize that there are dark times and there is struggle. If you will base your life on this found, these foundational understandings of what I'm trying to convey to you about who Jesus is and how significant he is, then it doesn't mean you're not gonna have those. But if you cling fast to those, that's what you need to pull you away from the door. It will always be the tether that kind of pulls you back from making the decision of walking back through the door the other way. If you don't have a tether, if you don't have that structure solidly wrapped around you, then you can walk out. You need the tether. You need to foundationally understand, commit, believe with everything that you are that though my life may hit you, God is a God who keeps his promises. And in the end, he sent his son to give us a constant way to be connected directly to him. This is the high priest that our pastor keeps talking about. He harps on it over and over and over again. We're going to talk about it a little bit in chapter 6. We're going to talk about it a ton next week. We're going to keep talking about it until we finish Hebrew because this is the foundational truth that you have to get deep within your soul or you will constantly struggle and you will constantly teeter on do I stay here or do I just abandon this choice? Do I stay here or I just abandon this choice? The one thing that I know solidly in all the years that I have chosen to follow Jesus is that my life, though not easy, I would never change the decision that I made to follow Jesus. There's no other option for me. There will never be another option for me. I am solidly set in that. It does not make my life easier but I am foundationally set in that. And so I'm gonna move from that place deeper into the house. But that's my tether. And that's, that needs to be all of our tethers. That needs to be what we are connected and committed to. And if you are not connected and committed to it, you have chosen to be dull of hearing. You want to drink the milk instead of eat the solid food. And ultimately, that will lead you to just walking away completely if you are not careful. It is a slope that we can keep going down. But that's us. That's not God. And we blame it on him a lot. But it's us that chooses that. <clears throat> okay. Any other thoughts before we dig into... 
chapter six. We'll just it'll just be a little bit of a continuation of this with some new some new things. Okay, let's read chapter six. We're gonna read a portion of chapter six, talk about it, and then we'll read the last portion. So starting in verse one. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gifts and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tested the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful for those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing for God, from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to be cursed and its end is to be burned. Okay, so it's not getting easier, right? <laughs> like like our, our pastor hadn't quite lightened up yet <laughs> in making his point. We start off in chapter six with this very hinge word, this therefore word. I, I know it's not the most important word in the Bible, but it is an extremely important word that our authors use when they want to connect what they've said before. I need you to understand before I can move on what came before to uh, what is coming next. So if you're ready for it, let me take you to the next step. <clears throat> Here he says, now we need to leave elementary doctrine and go on to maturity. So our pastor is asking them to be carried along, moved to maturity because of the power of God and what we already know and we've talked about in regard to Christ. Um, our pastor says, I want to trust that while you may be in danger of immaturity, you ultimately want more than immaturity. You want to be mature. So I've decided I am going to treat you as one who wants to move to maturity. I believe in you, our pastor says of his congregants. I believe that even though you have moved to a place of dullness, that's not really where you want to be. I love you enough, I'm in relationship with you, that I know that maybe you got there somehow and you're kind of there right now, but that's not where you wanna be. You wanna move forward. So I, though I have kind of thrown out the words and kind of said this is where you are, I'm gonna trust you, you want more. So I'm gonna take you to the more, he says. <clears throat> He's not urging them to forget foundational truths but to build upon the foundational truths that they already have. Um, it's a road that we're supposed to travel on, that we're supposed to follow, he says. To stay in this Christian life means to always be moving. And there are only two directions we can go that we've already talked about. We can go deeper or we can go adrift. So where are we going to go? Deeper or adrift? We're growing, maturing, becoming more profound in our faith, or we consent to float lazily along the surface, unaware that the treacherous currents are pulling us more and more off course until we are just hopelessly lost. Those are our two choices, our pastor says. He says, so here's what we're going to do. Because I trust that you're going to move to maturity, we're really not going to spend a lot of time on a few things. And he lists them. There's six things that he says, he kind of lists and says, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this. I'm, I'm going to trust that you really do know these things and we're going to move forward. But here's the things that I'm going to trust that you know. I'm going to trust that you already have the foundational understanding of repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works means this, so that we are clear. Work does not connect you to Jesus. You cannot work yourself into repentance and salvation. 
There is nothing that you can do that will be acceptable enough to Jesus. Accept that. You can choose Jesus. Beyond that, there's still no work that you can do. God doesn't want you to work yourself into heaven. He wants you to love him and obey him and have faith in him. And the work flows out of all of that love. We work for the goodness of God because we desire God so much. There is no work that will save us. Work's just a response to love and grace. So he says, I trust you know that. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. <clears throat> then he says, number two, faith, faith. We're not going to talk a lot about faith. I am going to trust that foundationally you understand that faith is living in assurance of God's promises for the future and of his power for the present. And that with Jesus, the future promise has moved to also present power. So I'm going to trust you have a foundation of faith and we're going to move forward. He also says, number three, we're not going to spend any time on the washing, on the, um, the instructions about washing, which we could consider baptism. We could also consider that the people of God at this time also um, kind of purification washing was a regular thing as well. Um, so he's saying we're not going to talk about the basics of washing for purification or uh, baptism because I trust that you understand those things as well. <clears throat> Number four, he says, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the laying of hands. Um, as stated with washing, the laying of hands was done in, with some of the earliest people of God in the earliest times. The laying of hands was a commissioning um, to those who have been chosen by God. Uh, it was a sign of those who were sent by God. A laying of hands was a commissioning forward. Uh, but I'm going to trust that you know that. So we don't have to spend time on it. So moving along. Number five, he says, we're not going to spend a lot of time on talking about the resurrection of the dead. And what goes with that is number six. Really, they're so interconnected with the eternal judgment. <clears throat> I trust that at some point you have come to really understand and accept that Jesus came again to establish the kingdom on earth. He will come again uh, to establish the kingdom on earth and he will dwell with us. Christians knew that Jesus' death and resurrection was the hope that the promise had been fulfilled and will be fulfilled. So he said, we're not going to spend any time on those things as we move towards more maturity. So, but he makes this interesting statement in um, kind of verse four through six. He says, here's the truth. If we stay in this place of spiritual immaturity, what you are doing is essentially hanging Jesus on the cross again. Isn't that painful to think of? That every time I may choose to, to drink milk instead of move forward, that I want to stay in my immaturity, that I am potentially making the choice to put Jesus back on the cross saying that was not enough. Prove to me more that I need to move deeper in my relationship with you because your sacrifice on the cross wasn't enough for me. I'm going to hang you up there over and over and over again until I am fully satisfied that I want that I want to move forward. It's impossible, he says, for those that who have been enlightened, who already know the truth of God and have lived it and then turned away to be welcomed in. Now, let me be clear about this. This has nothing to do with loss of salvation. You cannot take that argument right here. Well, this says that you lose your salvation. What our author is saying is this. The tragedy is that an overly great, it is an overly great loss for those who have experienced the grace and the mercy of God and his faithfulness to then just choose to walk away. How tragic 
would that be? Because what you then choose to walk away from is a life and love that reaches out and embraces you all the way from heaven. A Holy Spirit that comes to reveal truth and live within you. The word, the message of Jesus, that's like a cool drink on a hot day. Or food when you realize that you have not been so hungry in so long. You walk away from the power of the coming age, the new creation which God began in Jesus. When you choose infancy and when you choose that you just can't seem to go any deeper because you're just not that person, then you hang Jesus on the cross again and what a shame because you've known the hope and the love and the grace of God deeply and you walked away from it. To me, that's worse than someone who has no idea about Jesus and just says, I'm not interested. Please don't ask me again. They don't know yet the salvation that, that you feel, the peace and joy that could come. But as a Christian, we know it. And if we choose that we have no desire for it anymore, what a catastrophic loss that would be. So our pastor says, finally, before we continue on, let's go deeper. Let's develop more. If you've learned the ABCs thoroughly um, and you started off enthusiastically, then keep moving in that direction. Don't choose a different one. <clears throat> A commentator that I have been reading over the last few weeks, I'm going to read you something out of his book. It's a little bit long, but man, it's just so good that I kind of been talking about this, that I, there was no way that I could paraphrase it. I was just like, I got to read this straight to you. So um, sit back and kind of listen. This is what he says about this, what our Hebrew author is saying. People reject the Christian faith of all kinds of reasons. Some are alienated by the hypocrisy of the church and never make it past the front door. Some never have a chance to hear the gospel. Others heard the gospel preached all the time, but not in a way that makes sense or speaks to their needs. Still others are persuaded that the faith is intellectually indefensible, a pious retreat from vigorous thought. There are many reasons why people turn away from faith. It's one thing when the Christian faith is rejected by those who do not know its depths and power, by those outside the church or those who have only skimmed the surface of the faith. Such refusal is sad, of course, but not necessarily tragic yet. When people push away what they do not fully know or understand, there's always the prospect that later they will see what they did not understand before. That discovery will lead to interest an interest to repentance and renewal. It is far more tragic, however, when the faith is rejected by those who do, not know, who do know its depths, those who have tasted the heavenly gift. When those who have profound insight about, he, about the gospel, who have experienced grace in the depths of their lives, who have discern, discerned that they are guided and comforted by God's spirit, who have heard God speaking to their hearts, and who have been given a peace that the world cannot provide. When such as these turn their backs on the faith, it is a grievous and seemingly irreparable tragedy. They're not walking out on what they did not understand, but from what they understood. They fall away in spite of God's mercy and love. And so our author says, Please, don't hang Jesus on the cross again. Don't walk away. It's beyond tragic. Would you understand the gift that you have been given? Why would you ever want to walk away from that? Why would you not desire more of it? The closer we move to Christ, the more we walk the journey 
the more love and grace we get to experience because we see more of Jesus. He becomes more infused into us. Why would you want to walk away from that? Don't walk away from that, our pastor says. In this last portion of <clears throat> this beginning part of chapter 6, it says this. Though we speak in this way, this is verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have this, the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Our pastor is making a slight shift again in this last portion. He says this, even though I have brought these things up for us to evaluate and to question where we are, my confidence is that you, congregation, will hear these words and respond in a positive way. Because I know that you love God. And because I love you, ultimately, I know you want Jesus. But you've got to change. And you've got to move forward. <clears throat> Verse 10 kind of talks about that God isn't discarding what has come before. God never discards what you have done before. He sees your actions, your love, and your intentions that you've had. But at this point, are you going to continue to move forward and strive to stay connected, to see the bigger purpose that God has, and to hold fast to the truth? See, the fact is, is that grace is grace. God loves us because he loves us, not because we manage to do things to impress him or to notch up a few points on some heavenly scoreboard. God continues to say, I'm here. I want you. I desire you. Just keep walking towards me. Live in that assurance and move forward, our pastor says. Here's the crux. Don't wait until you feel like living a holy life or until you are fully assured that you know enough about your neighbor that you can really love them or that this project that you've committed to in the name of Jesus is really what you're supposed to be doing. It's everywhere what you're supposed to be doing. You continue to move forward. We make a start every day. Scripture says every day is a new day. What has gone before yesterday was yesterday, and we start new and afresh today. So you live and choose today that you may not feel it, you may not be fully assured of it, but you're going to walk forward in it, and you're going to walk towards matur maturity with God. Nothing could be further from dullness of heart than faith and patience, our pastor says. We will see later that our pastor will even talk about some pretty significant people in the story of the people of God who practiced faith and patience. And our author will use those people to again contend, continue to draw us back to this idea that while life may be crazy and this may be hard, cling to faith and patience in Christ and know where your anchor is, and move forward, he says. So, thoughts, questions. <clears throat> you know, there are people in your life that, whether it's at work, or whether it's some family members, that you don't get along with, they're hard to, to love, and... <coughs> We are asked to love them. Mm -hmm. But it's like you said about you don't feel. Mm -hmm. And you can't wait for the loving feeling to come. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you have to choose to love them. Because mm -hmm. really, all love is, 
is a choice. Mm -hmm. I choose to love you no matter how you treat me, no matter what you've done to me or what you've said to me. And if you, if you continue along those lines and you pray for them, mm -hmm. that feeling that you have has to change. It will, it will change. But it is a choice mm -hmm. in the beginning. It, it has to be just a choice. That's right. <coughs> Anybody else? Thoughts? Questions? I think we're lucky that God does give us mercy and forgiveness that we mm -hmm. can pick up and go forward when we backslide. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can't forget the power of the Holy Spirit in that <coughs> movement. That's right. Yeah. Because that's the only way. That's right. Yeah. I don't think we... <clears throat> I don't think we as a body talk about the Holy Spirit enough and the power of the Holy Spirit and, and, or acknowledge how significant the Holy Spirit is. I mean, I think we can say on a, a kind of a, you know, flat line kind of foundational, well, you know, when we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes within us and he dwells within us. I mean, the significance of that itself is so the idea that God himself would choose to dwell within us. Where there was a time that God was so, his presence was so separated from the people of God that only one guy went in once a year and he had to be super careful about it to get anywhere near the presence of God. And now, because of Christ, there, there's no longer that separation and he chooses to dwell within the brokenness of us. And not only that, but the things that he chooses to speak to us and how he, through the Holy Spirit, tries to guide us. And we don't give it enough credit. Or, or maybe we're just confused and, and unsure about what it really means, um, the Holy Spirit's role within our lives. Um, and I, we, we gotta do a better job of really Acknowledging that and living in that and knowing that. Yeah, you're right. It's hugely significant. Well, and, and through the, the Holy Spirit, we can evaluate. We can see mm -hmm. if we are in this category. Yeah. Versus, are we still based? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You don't talk about it because you don't really want to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Bible says it's Christ in me. <laughs> forget about the Holy Spirit because we're so focused on Christ. And that's mm -hmm. not a bad thing mm -mm. because we forget that it's three in one. Yeah. But if, if, you, if you feel Christ in you, mm -hmm. then that's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. that's and that's the, I think that's part of what our, our pastor is trying to convey in, this, in his sermon is foundationally, if you have your core of Christ, then the other aspects you can spend more time kind of thinking through and focusing on because you know definitively and you're so connected to who Christ is in your life and his value that you don't have to go back and question that and wonder about that and struggle with that anymore. Now you can move on to other things like how do we really see the Holy Spirit working in our lives? How do you know if the voice of the Holy Spirit is really speaking to you? These are the questions that I, I mean, I struggle with these questions. How do I know that this is the, what I'm supposed to do? How do I know that this is the voice of the Holy Spirit and not just me, right? I, I'm, hopefully I'm not the only one that struggles with this. If I am, I'm just in confession time right now. But I, I have this struggle all the time. I, I'm faced with something. I feel like I'm supposed to do something. I think it's the Holy Spirit. But because I want to do what God wants me to do, I step back and say, is this, is this me or the Holy Spirit, right? That's the importance of the Holy Spirit is that discernment. And then at some point, though, you make a decision. Because otherwise, you've decided yourself too much to just sitting back and not doing anything, right? So we don't, we've become um, inept at even moving because we're questioning it too much. But, but I struggle with that. Is this the Holy Spirit? Is this, is this me? 
we should ask that question all the time. Is this the Holy Spirit? Is this the thing that I'm supposed to be doing? But again, that's the continuation of spiritual maturity. Because if we're not asking ourselves that all the time, really, then we've discarded the importance of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in our lives. Would you do like the same thing if you, if you feel like in your mind, if you feel that it's Christ speaking to you, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. it's, that's the same thing. Yes, right? yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's because I spent the majority of my life focusing on Christ mm -hmm. and it was like a light bulb went on one day and it's not, it's like I'd let the Holy Spirit out. Although I know, mm -hmm. I, I understand the mm -hmm. three in one. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's with us now. That's right. But, but when I'm thinking that I'm being led, mm -hmm. I think of it in terms of Christ. That's okay. I think that's more semantics than anything else because if you if you believe in the Trinity, it's just a semantic. He's he's just one of the three that should be leading us. So there's no wrong in that. It's when you don't acknowledge that it's any of them, and it becomes you that's leading you. Sometimes I think too when when you think you've done the right thing, mm -hmm. then I think that's mm -hmm. I think that. That's what God wanted you to do. Yeah. And if you feel bad about it, mm -hmm. or quite indecisive about it, mm -hmm. then I don't think he's quite working anymore, hasn't mm -hmm. finished with you. Yeah. But there's maturity in trying to discern yes. those feelings. <clears throat> and then there's maturity in saying, if faced with something similar again, what would I then do differently as a mature Christian? You know what I'm saying? So... Um, so yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, there's, there's, um, we were talking about in my small group last night, um, how we interact with one another when we are angry or frustrated. And one of the things that, um, the, the Bible study person said was we have to step back and evaluate. Is it, um, is it me? Like, it, am I, is just, is, is this just about me or is this about something that, really is about God. And our job is to act on the things that are about God and not the things that are about me. And that discernment can be hard. And sometimes you make a decision and you realize you didn't make the right decision, but what do you do differently next time? Or do you just see, continue to repeat the same situation over and over again? You haven't learned then. Maybe because you have no desire to learn. Um, so. Well, you know one of the bottom lines is that hopefully you're going to end up in heaven, and you're going to see so many, you're going to say, how did he That's <laughs> true. <laughs> that, is, that is true, because it is not our job That's to make that decision, job. which is good. It'd be a small party, I think, if I got the choice, you know? <laughs> So it's a good thing that I don't, I don't choose that. Well, if, if, if we were in charge, heaven wouldn't have to be quite so big. Exactly. My little mansion would be a McMansion, and uh, <laughs> there wouldn't be too many people. It'd be a, it'd be, but that's, that's, that is my human judgment of things that does not see the greater picture, and I have to fight to and see I the continued. That is a lot more that's right. Than we are. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I have to choose to continue to see the created value and the image of every person. And I believe when you get to heaven, if you see that person or that you're questioning, <laughs> that God, God is going to have taken that attitude in you yeah. away. Yeah. And you're going to see everyone as your That's right. Mother, yeah. Know, yeah. We're going to love everybody. That's right. It's going to be that's right. I will be free from the other. <laughs> I believe. Good, 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 good. <laughs> That's what you need. Yes, believe and move forward. Do we really believe we know better than God? We act like it. We sure do act like it a lot. Yeah, that's right. You ain't got a chance. 
Well, yeah, <clears throat> that's right. God does have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe, that, believe that. Look at all the jokes around you. <laughs> Heaven's going to be pretty good. Uh, yeah. I think they'll need comedy. <laughs> 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 yeah, that is, uh, you know, but that's, you know, that's a great point that you got to ask yourself that. I mean, do you really, do I really think that I believe more and understand and know more than God? But my actions say that I do. They sure do. It is the human nature. And, and I get the one thing that I, I know that I know is that we will constantly war with the human nature, with sin within our lives. It's an excuse. But it is an excuse, that's right. It becomes an excuse because I also know, as Scripture states, and as I have experienced in my own life, there are and have been just pure moments of perfection with God. And that glimpse of something so much more than me is what I desire to experience even more of because it is unfathomably amazing and it has nothing to do with me. But God gives us those glimpses because it's about Him and it should always be about Him. And it's such joy. Mm -hmm. It is. Pure joy. Mm -hmm. How can you not yeah. believe and see so much healing? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But we do sometimes. We choose not to. Yeah. So as we end today and before we, um, for, for next week, I guess um, I was hugely convicted of, of about this reading for this week. And I told Marie multiple times, because I've been in this passage for weeks. It's like, I mean, he's just rough. <laughs> and I wanted to blame it on him, how I felt, you know, like he's just being mean and whatever. But I got to, I got to sit and ask myself, am I dull? You know? Yeah. Don't you want the truth? Yeah. Would you yeah. want a God who wasn't perfect? Hmm. No. Yeah. About it. yeah. Yeah. So I hope that this week, even though we're going to move on <clears throat> during this week, you're going to move on to read our next section. Man, it's been some time. Spend some time with the Holy Spirit, kind of reading back through this, these passages and asking yourself, like, if you dare, I guess. <laughs> this is the challenge and the dare. Go back and read them and ask yourself. Have I become dull of hearing? Am I desiring milk instead of solid food? Where do I need to change that? I mean, do I really want more of God? Or am I satisfied with just where I am? I hope all of our answer is, nah, I'm not satisfied. I want more of Jesus, you know? Um, and then what do you need to do? Well, I think the fact that we're all here. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, it's a big part of it. Yeah. I am, um, I told somebody, I think sometime last year, <clears throat> I said, if I wasn't in ministry, God hadn't called me to ministry, I'm not sure where I would be as a Christian. Um, I'm, I don't know that I would desire him as much. I, f I find it fascinating that God knew <laughs> God knew what I was going to need to continue to be drawn to him. Because I think left to my own devices, working somewhere else or doing what else, whatever else, he would be on the back burner. And I would just do the rote thing about God. I needed something very specific, and God knew that about me. Um, and getting to study scripture is what continues to be that factor in my life that draws myself to him. But that's who we're supposed to be, is people who are studying the word of God and not for study's sake, but to know him more. Um, 
that's, that's why we do it. It's why we should hunger for it. Um, on our own, in a group, on Sunday morning, all that kind of stuff. And, and like Marie said last week, and we do it together and we encourage one another because we're going to stumble and have a hard time. Let me make it clear. I didn't choose this. <laughs> God chose this, and I have learned in my maturity to say, yes, sir. <laughs> but I still got to learn that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't like the dirt very much, so <laughs> let's just stay here. Let's pray. So we pray, God, I mean, just come Holy Spirit. Come and continue to be with us and um, help us to be brave enough to ask some really difficult questions of ourselves and to be honest enough to answer them. And then Holy Spirit, help us to take the next step toward you, the deeper step, whatever that may be for each one of us. Help us to live out our faith. Help us to desire more faith. Help us to reach towards patience and love, and grace, and mercy. And then help us to take further steps into the midst of those things and to extend them even more to others. Because what I do know, God, and what you have said over and over is if my people would be a light to everyone, people are drawn to the light. You are the light. So shine within us brightly because we want to be brighter and brighter and brighter and draw closer and closer and closer to you, God. Thank you for loving us. I mean, thank you for loving us. And that's not enough. That thank you is just will never be enough. But thank you. Go with us this week. Speak to us and speak through us. We pray, Holy Spirit. Amen.